Good morning, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to our latest simulation CFD tech support hangout, today focusing on rotating machinery. My name is John Wild and I'm one of the senior uh, support specialists with the uh, specifically the simulation CFD team. Um, I think you'll probably notice as we progress that there's quite a lot of detail on many of the slides. Um, really I'm hoping to that I've created a kind of ultimate guide to setting up um, rotating machinery models. Um, hopefully I've not left anything out, but we'll see. Um, feel free to ask any questions via text and then we'll open up the lines and we'll, we'll all help uh, with answering your questions at the end. So what I want to cover um, initially just talking about the differences between a uh, motion analysis and a rotating region analysis. Um, and then I'm going to really run through a basic setup, so directly from the CAD model all the way through into CFD, going through the new normal steps of boundary conditions, materials, meshing and solving. Um, and then we'll take a look at some of the post analysis type functions that we have. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the pump API, which is an automated pump curve creation tool. So when I was asked to do this hangout, initially I kind of um, thought, okay, there's really two approaches, uh, motion and rotating region. Um, the motion analysis, we would assign a, uh, a motion to uh, the impeller, and that would move through a static fluid mesh. Uh, the rotating region is slightly different, so we would mesh the impeller within a rotating region, and the impeller and the mesh very near it would also move. Uh, I thought I'd do a pros and cons list of the two to kind of get an idea of which I should focus on, and really I couldn't find any advantages of using motion. Um, apart from the last one. So there's many disadvantages. Um, running with motion, the, the, the biggest kind of disadvantage is that we disable the boundary layer mesh, um, which isn't ideal for accuracy, and it isn't ideal for using the types of turbulence models that we've come to use with rotating region models. Um, because of this limitation, it, if we were to use motion, we'd need far more mesh to be able to capture the wall profile and try to capture some kind of boundary layer. Um, which really means that our run times become almost impossibly long and uh, we reduce the accuracy versus a rotating region model. The only advantage of using uh, motion is if we have a single blade pump or some kind of non-symmetrical impeller, which we simply at the moment can't do with a rotating region. So the rotating region is an additional part that you'd add to your CAD model. Uh, it captures the rotation of the impeller or the, any of the kind of moving parts um, and some of the fluid very close to it. Um, we set the, the properties of the impeller to the uh, rotating region. So that might be one of the three that I've got listed there, either a, a rotational speed, which is generally what we use. Um, you can also apply a driving torque or just allow it to be free spinning. Um, some of the outputs you get out are the torque values, so if you've applied a rotational speed, CFD would tell you the torque value um, via a text file. Even though we're not using motion but we're using a rotating region, you do still need the motion solver. Okay, so starting from CAD, uh, generally what we have um, is probably a fairly complicated model, but we need to start stripping it down before launching it to CFD to make it what we call CFD ready. So ultimately what we'd like to have is just an impeller and a volute, so no fastenings, no labels, um, ideally no axles if we can. And there's normally some pretty small gaps and features in the models, um, as you can see on the very left of the screen, uh, we've got some very small gaps in this region and the best thing to do is to close them up and you can see we've done that on the right so everything kind of meets very nicely. And the same down the bottom, where we had small radii, which are both difficult to mesh and also really a waste of uh, computational time, uh, we generally would remove those. We would then add two additional parts to the model, uh, an inlet on the suction side, normally five times diameter in length, and a slightly longer outlet on the discharge side. Uh, the reason for this is because we want to make sure that we've got nicely developed flow entering the volute and also we have a nice long outlet to make sure that we don't have any recirculation over the outlet boundary condition which can lead to instability 
and also a drop in accuracy. Okay, so just to talk about adding this rotating region part to our CAD. In most real-world models, uh, the rotating region should sit uh, like it is on the top right of the screen, so exactly halfway between the impeller and the wall um, of the model. This is a general rule, um, so you'll see it's just positioned right here. Um, this isn't always applicable, so if we take a look at the images on the bottom, um, if this means that the rotating region um, could protrude a long way, uh, we wouldn't use that approach, or if it's very small, often what we might do is make the impeller uh, meet the wall and the rotating region impeller and wall could share the same surface. And the other exception also is if the volume is very large compared to the impeller. Uh, what we might do is again just make the rotating region fit around the impeller but generally have roughly two elements between the impeller and the edge of the rotating region just to make sure that we capture the flow in that region. I did notice while I was uh, putting this together that in our, in our wiki, um, it actually says that a rotating region must not be in direct contact uh, with a solid region. Uh, and generally, that's true, but we can also um, have them meet if, if we need to, if the leakage piles are very, very small. Okay, so once we've got our model ready, we'd launch hey, John. it into CFD. Yeah. Hey, can you try getting your mic a little closer to your mouth? It is a little bit quiet. Oh, I can try. Okay, is that better? It's a little better, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to go so much closer before I eat it. <laughs> okay, um, so boundary conditions. Um, for an open condition, where you would generally just apply a zero pressure at the inlet and the outlet. Um, if we wanted to not run an open condition but instead predict a point on the pump curve, uh, we might apply a condition at the outlet. Generally that's going to be either a pressure, uh, a kind of pressure head or a flow rate. And what we found through experience is that it's good to have this uh, boundary condition ramp up over time rather than starting at the, the first iteration. Um, the reason for that being that we ramp the pump up over 50 iterations and if we have a, a pressure head at the outlet that starts immediately, we can find that we have a backflow through the model, which isn't ideal. So we generally have the rotating region and any of the outlet conditions ramping up over 50 iterations. So what I do, um, and the, the uh, small table on the top right there, um, our boundary condition is ramping up at the moment over a second. But once we set the model up and we've got the solve um, ready and we've got the right amount of time steps, or the time step size set, we would visit, revisit the boundary conditions and materials to change at one second to represent 50 um, iterations. Uh, we do the same thing with the materials. So we would pick our rotating region. Most of the materials are set um, exactly as reality, so your external solids would be solid, your fluid maybe air or water. Um, and then we pick our rotating region. I generally just use a standard uh, rotating region and rename it to suit my RPM and the number of uh, blades that the impeller has. And again, I'll do the same thing, ramp it up initially over one second, and we'll come back and revisit the materials to ramp it up over those 50 iterations um, once we know what our time step size is likely to be. Again, within CFD, we're just working from left to right along the kind of small thumbnails at the top. So the next one is meshing. Um, so unless we need to consider any heat transfer, we gen generally suppress all of the solid parts, including the impeller. And we can still add mesh refinement to the suppressed impeller. And because the, the impeller and the rotating region are moving as one, this um, localized mesh will be applied to the local fluid around the blade tips um, and trailing edges. So we can end up with a very, very nice mesh. Uh, we do generally recommend, or at least um, add the leading edges and trailing edges to a group so that I can reselect them later for further refinement if I choose. Um, and I would generally apply a uniform mesh similar to what you see in the bottom left screen. So we're making sure that we're capturing the, the profile very nicely. We would do a similar thing to the um, exit of the volute. Um, either selecting the, the critical surface that I have 
in red on the screen, or we may add a, a, an actual meshing region so that we can spread the local meshing around a little further. So as the flow kind of splits and either recirculates further around the volume or exits out, we can capture that region really nicely. And always the final step to do when we're refining the mesh um, is to select the two um, surfaces on the rotating region that represent the inlet and the outlet. Um, these both must have a uniform mesh. Uh, the reason for this is the these two surfaces are really where the flow enters from the static mesh of the fluid into the moving mesh of the rotating region. And we need to make sure that those elements where they meet are as similar as possible. Uh, in some cases, it's often worth coarsening the mesh from the default um, uniform mesh because it can be rather fine. But um, you know, see how it goes when you start to mesh the model. And really the final change to make uh, within meshing, and I'll explain why a bit more later, is to suit the um, SST K omega terminus model, which is what we generally use for rotating models. Um, as you'll see on the left hand side, this is a standard mesh, so it's three layers of 45% of the first element. On the right hand side, we've changed this slightly, so we're still using the same um, layer factor, so 45% of the first element, but we're using five layers, and we've also changed the layer gradation to 1.25, so as you can see, um, the elements become smaller and smaller as they get closer to the wall. This really is to reduce the Y plus value, uh, which will increase accuracy for us when we're using this particular terminus model. Okay, so moving on to talk about some solver settings. Um, some of these next slides do have a lot of information, but really I'll just kind of talk about the critical things. Um, from CFD 2015 onwards, uh, instead of having uh, running in two stages, so running blade to blade and then running a certain amount of time steps per iteration, we're recommending that we start the run and complete the run with three degrees per time step. We would use the time step calculator here. So in the bottom left in the small box, you'll see that I've entered three degrees per time step and you press calculate and that CFD will then use the RPM from your material to calculate a time step size. Uh, generally we turn on stream function as we mentioned in the meshing troubleshooting hangout uh, we, that we ran a few weeks ago really so that we can make sure that the nodal aspect ratio of the elements within the rotating region are below a value of 100 which should uh, indicate that we're seeing a fairly accurate result. We would also utilize um, Advection Scheme 5. Uh, just as a side note as, although we do recommend using three degrees per time step, sometimes we may need to use a smaller time step. And the general rule here is if we're moving more than four elements past the, on the outside of the rotating region past the fluid elements at a time, then we may need to move um, use smaller degrees per time step, perhaps even down to something like 0.5 over degree. Um, as I mentioned within the meshing, uh, for rotating machinery, uh, we've tested all of the turbulence models and we found that SST K Omega generally gives us the best correlation with test data. Uh, and there's an example on the right hand side there. Um, really it helps us to produce yeah, the most accurate solution and I think really that's because it captures flow separation the best. So we're capturing the flow around those leading and trailing edges and the kind of really critical areas within the rotating machinery. Uh, generally, we recommend uh, five to ten layers of mesh enhancement using the settings that I had mentioned earlier. So start with five and perhaps increase it to ten and see if the results change and do a little mesh comparison. I wanted to mention save intervals, um, purely because many support cases we get have a, a very large number of save intervals from the beginning to the end of the analysis and this can create huge files that are actually quite hard to manipulate and can just maximize the RAM on your computer and cause further problems. So generally what I do is not save any save intervals at all uh, until I'd completed my analysis and then perhaps revisit the analysis and just save a few intervals um, on a single revolution to create that kind of animation that was probably what I was after in the first place. There are, I think, other better ways to track um, the the, the um, the analysis as we progress rather than using save intervals. Uh, one of those is monitor points, but I will mention that uh, in a few more slides time. So once we've 
um, set up our solver, what we'll do is revisit both the materials, so the rotating region and the boundary condition, so that's going to be our outlet condition where you might have a pressure or a flow rate assigned. And now that we know what our time step is going to be, we're going to multiply that by 50 and enter that in the second box on the right hand side that you can see. So our rotating region and boundary condition will both go from zero to their full value in the first 50 iterations and then they will stay at that full value for the rest of the analysis. Again, still within the setup, um, at any point in materials, boundary conditions, uh, meshing, you can right click and add a monitor point or multiple points. I would generally do this um, at the inlet and the outlet. Uh, we can track these as the model's running. So you'll see in the convergence graph, I'll show you in a moment, um, you can switch instead of looking at the global convergence of all the variables, just to a specific point so we can track the pressure or the flow rate um, at the outlet from the beginning of the analysis to the end. The advantages of this is that we're not taking up time uh, by saving all the save intervals and it's really a kind of memory free uh, method of tracking what's happening over time. So once the model's running, uh, we're likely to want to assess the convergence and make sure that we're turning towards a converged solution. Now for most analyses, CFD will automatically stop when it reaches a converged solution and it really looks at the gradients of these lines to help it do that. But um, we can't do that here because we're plotting all of the variables globally over time and as you can see, um, in most of the velocity components at least are, are cycloidal. So what we do is um, either take a look at pressure, which is the black line that's pretty smooth, uh, we could use our monitor points, which hopefully we've applied to monitor the pressure or flow rate at the outlet. Um, and we can also stop the analysis and take a look at the rotating region results, where we can plot the torque. So you'll see on the graph on the bottom, that's the torque over time. So there's an initial kind of large impulse as we start to move the impeller, and then it will gradually become uh, more and more stable as the uh, fluid is moving internally. Uh, we can actually automate this process. A colleague of mine who I'm sure almost all of you have spoken to, Royce Abel, created an um, API to automate the creation of a pump curve. So I'm going to demonstrate this in a second because I think it's probably easier than looking at a PowerPoint, but the basics really are that we can create a full curve from um, a single scenario. So we'll start by setting up the model just as I've done, but um, we won't assign any boundary conditions. Instead, we would put the um, inlet in a group called inlet and the outlet surface in a group called outlet. Um, and then we'll complete this table and you'll see that CFD will create a scenario for each point that we have on the curve. So just to very quickly demonstrate that, this is a simple um, tutorial model that you can find um, within the tutorial folder. Uh, you'll see that um, in my groups, if I just switch across the surfaces. I've got a, um, a, a group called inlet that has one single surface in it. And if I select my outlet, uh, what I do is right click and create a group called outlet. And now we're pretty much ready to use the API. So what this is going to do is clone this scenario and it's going to create a scenario for every single point on the pump curve that we request. So I'm going to ask CFD to give us, um, let's say, eight different points on a pump curve. And we just work from top to bottom, obviously. So we enter the number of blades that we have, in this case, four. Our pump's operating at 600 RPM. We're estimating 20 gallons a minute. So this is going to be our full flow rate. And then CFD is going to break that down to zero over the eight different steps. Uh, generally, we leave this value as zero. So instead, now of running blade to blade before we switch to running a small amount of iterations per time step. We're just going to start with the three and we're going to run for 20 revolutions. And when we press run, CFD will then go away, clone this scenario and create multiple scenarios for us to um, create our pump curve. Royce, right, so at this point, do you want to speak about the... Uh, so while this is, yeah. yeah, so while this is going, um, and this is something I did over a year ago, as a small project of mine internally to help our pump customers because doing all this is very repetitive. In a moment you'll see 
the report that is generated afterwards that pulls off all this data. And all this was done with our Python API, and really, you know, we have some documentation of how to use it, but we've never had a whole lot of training around how to use it. So one thing I want to know is if we want to leverage this Hangout session at some point in the future to introduce the API a little more, go through an example, and all that kind of um, kind of ad hoc training. So right now, I'm actually just going to pose a question to you guys in terms of would you like a Hangout around using the API? And this is the Python API specifically. There is another one that's around JavaScript. Um, Okay, so just so you know, right now we've had 50% uh, of people voted, and we're at about 88% saying yes. So just so you know, what I'll probably do as my example is go off of what I did last session with Turbulence Model. So at one point, if you ever saw that, I laid out three examples of kind of a basic, intermediate, and advanced in terms of how to approach Turbulence. So what I'm going to look about doing is basically writing a script where you have a button at the top, that's, well, three buttons, one says basic, intermediate, advanced, you click that, and it sets up everything based on you know, that configuration. And I'll go through the code that's necessary to do that. I think that'll be a good place to start. Okay. So then, otherwise, John, back to you. So about 90% of people said yes, so I'll definitely do that. Great, that gives you a, a nice job in the future, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so now the um, API has done its stuff, so you'll see on the left hand side of the screen we have um, multiple scenarios. So you've got all the different operating points from full flow to no flow. Um, you'll see that CF Design has, <laughs> sorry, simulation CFD to old school, has um, assigned a transient flow rate to the outlet. So that's doing exactly what you want and it's going to ramp up over time. Um, in a moment, we're going to revisit this and take a look at some results, but I'm just going to switch back to the PowerPoint uh, for now. Okay, so um, what I did when I ran this is utilize simulation flex, which meant that I could run all of these operating points in parallel on the cloud. Uh, it's just an amazing use for Simflex, so we don't have to run, run them in series. You know, we can get all of the results very, very quickly. Um, and then once we've run it, we use process data to produce an Excel file. And what that will do is give us a pump performance curve, and it will also break each operating point down and give us the details of each. So if we um, switch now to that Excel spreadsheet, what you'll see uh, along the bottom are many thumbnails. So the first one is a performance curve. So this is giving us each point, uh, the, the flow rate, uh, pressure head, and the efficiency as well. So the blue curve we can see is the pump curve, and the orange line is the efficiency. So this gives us not just the curve, but also where we really want to be operating this pump on the curve in reality. Uh, we can switch across and look at the torque curve as well. So this gives us the torque over time for each operating point. Um, and the reason I really wanted to show this is because you can see that the full flow here, where we haven't got a flow rate assigned, but we're just running a pressure-driven only analysis, uh, takes a lot longer to reach conversion. So that kind of gives us an idea that it's better to use a flow rate at the outlet than using uh, a pressure or a pressure head. And we can also just visit any of these operating points. So you'll see that uh, it, this just gives us a little more information about each specific one. So it breaks the torque down. So it gives us an average of the last few torque measurements. And it will also give us the power output of the pump uh, and the efficiency. OK, so I'm just waiting for my computer to catch up back to the presentation. Um, if we hadn't run the pump API, I suppose if we, even if we had and we wanted to start to look at the results in more detail and kind of get into some of the numerical um, results that we may see, uh, I thought I'd run through a few of those too. So on the top here, we can see the same uh, torque curve that we had before. So within CFD, you can just um, extract the rotating region results and the torque will, um, you can extract this into Excel and then plot the torque results over time. Uh, we may have used a monitor point on the outlet and that would, of course, have given us the pressure at the outlet or the volume flow rate over time. But this is still just a single point, and that 
value may change over the whole area. Hopefully not, but you know it's worth a check. So we can add a cut plane to that area and use the bulk calculator as I've done here to give us the flow rate and the pressure averaged over that entire surface. Uh, we could then start to look a little bit more at some localized um, results. So on the top right there, I've just put a cut plane through the impeller so we can see how the flow uh, leaves the blade tips. And we can also see some recirculation around the tongue and the exit there. So that might be something we want to revisit um, just to try to minimize that and improve the efficiency of the pump overall. Uh, we would also use ISO surfaces for many reasons, really, I guess, um, for trying to um, find where we've got the or locate the regions of highest flow, um, the lowest pressure, which is indicative or can be indicative of cavitation, um, and also just to check the nodal aspect ratio to make sure that this is below that 100 value within the rotating region. Um, and I thought I'd also show an animation, so I did what I said you shouldn't do and um, capture results from the beginning of the analysis uh, to the end. But um, I just wanted to share uh, this small animation that just kind of shows you that process. So this is the pump starting up from zero and then running up to full speed. Okay. Um, that completes everything that I wanted to share. Can I ask if anybody has any questions? The one thing I do want to bring up is um, you know, John suggested to be running with three degrees right from the beginning, which to me is, is fully acceptable. You'll get more accurate results. You don't need to manage your simulation once the blade-to-blade -blade approach has ended, and then your three-degree analysis is continued from there. But if it is a very large model, then running with blade-to-blade -blade from the start to develop the flow quicker is fully acceptable. It's just more of a... Um, you know, cost-benefit analysis kind of thing, or pro-con of which one you want to really use. You know, if you're using 360, you know, the cloud version, the simulation flex, then I would go right ahead right from three degrees because you're charged your 15 credits for that three-degree analysis. You might as well just leverage that instead of continuing the run when then you're charged for another 15 credits. Okay? That's one reason why I mentioned that. Thanks, Royce. Thanks. Are there any questions coming in that we should uh, talk about? Yeah, there are a couple yeah, here. Yeah, one just came in. I'm just trying to start read through them right now. Yeah, Paul, if you want to bring up. So it says, uh, once you've converged steady state flow rate and you want to model a transient event like a change in pressure head, can you increase your time step without losing flow? Um, so to, to kind of just answer that one as well, um, yeah, once with, with the results for the pump, so as soon as you've got a you know, steady result at that point, if you wanted to go back and you know, change a boundary condition at the inlet, for example, to represent a, a change in that flow rate or a change in head, um, at that point you could continue and maintain the existing results and see how it evolves from there to that new state. Um, as far as the time step size selection, we would uh, we would base that based off of the uh, the change that you're trying to make, and you know the, the the impeller itself. So, kind of as Royce just mentioned, with you know the blade to blade or kind of continuing with uh, with three degrees, um, you know, either one of those are, are fine. Uh, the other thing about making that change is we we wouldn't want to you know call it shock the system instantaneously so if we were at say a given flow rate of you know 20 gallons per minute immediately go back and set that to 100 or to zero um, typically an event is going to have some duration some time for ramp up or ramp down so we'd want to replicate that uh, accordingly
just taking a look at some of the others as well. So there's a couple of people asking about the Pump um, API. So if you just look on our um, App Exchange uh, page, you'll find that located there. But I thought I'd also just quickly um, cover where you can find that within the interface. So we did have one question that came in about why don't streamlines go through rotating blades? Why is that? It has to do with kind of a, the life cycle of a streamline as it goes through the blades. As it actually enters the blade with default settings, it will naturally want to kind of go right and hit the blades. You know, that's what happens. The blade kind of impacts the air in a way. So what you actually need to do when you look at the results is switch to a relative velocity instead of um, you know, that will then allow the traces to flow right through the rotating region um, instead of kind of impacting the blades. Now, John, do you have a, a result that you can show what I'm talking about there? <laughs> yeah, let me see. a little bit slow, I think, but um, so just throw some traces through it. Okay, and honestly, Royce, I wasn't quite sure what I should do either. <laughs> so we're going to, instead of, yeah, you're going to have to explain to me, honestly. Oh, so right-click in the velocity magnitude legend, switch to relative velocity. Sure. There you go. Okay. Oh, cool. So that's how you allow your, your streamlines, your traces to actually work its way through the rotating region. There was some improvements done for 2015 to allow the traces to go longer. And I, I'd worked with the developer on why these traces became stuck. And uh, if you look at the traces, you'll notice how they sort of get stuck along the blade edge in itself. And eventually, since it's kind of skirting along the blade, eventually it just dies, and that's why I get stuck. Cool. I learned something, too. Just taking a look at some of the other questions. I can't see anything that hasn't already been answered, honestly, or that's... So there was a question in there about, is K-Omega as stable as K-Epsilon? Any other recommendation settings when using K-Omega other than uh, greater than five mesh layers? What I would suggest you to do is actually to watch our turbulence model presentation that's on YouTube from about a month ago. And as Apollo just responded, they are equally as stable, and typically as long as you have five layers and 85, you should be okay. And I'd agree with that. And the reason why we, if you watch the turbulence discussion, excuse me, discussion, we mentioned, you know, 10 layers for the KMEG model. So people that are kind of, we like, well, why are we saying five here? And that's really more of, we have seen with, with at least turbo machinery models like this, five layers have produced reasonable results, and it's compromised the runtime. You know, a lot of these models do take a lot, long time to run because they're transient. And you know, five layers if it's proving to be acceptable, then great. You know, that will allow this to solve faster. Hey, Roy, should we ask a couple of questions on based on the poll at the beginning as well? Um, so it seemed like um, the main kind of issues people are having with rotating regions were both accuracy and solve time. Um, I don't know if people wanted to post, you know, what, what they're kind of finding, so what, what accuracies you're seeing versus what you're expecting, um, and how long these are taking to run versus, I guess, what you're expecting or what you're hoping for. Yeah, that'd be great if people want to pose um, or elaborate on you know, the, what they really responded to in that earlier, earlier poll question. I think that'd be great. You know, if you actually look at 
that pull response, just so people are aware. Most people actually said, about 28%, said that solve time was their largest pitfall for rotating regions. Fortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do there other than, you know, is there a better meshing strategy you can go about to, you know, solve your analysis. You know, maybe you're over meshing your simulation, that's why your solve time is so poor. Another option is if it is really that long, you go with that blade to blade, followed by three degree approach instead of going from three degree from the beginning. Another thing that we do on some models, and this is not as common, so don't take it with uh, a hard set rule, but with some larger fans, for instance, or when you have a large domain that your um, system is going into, kind of circulating onto itself, in other words, instead of a defined inlet and defined outlet, then sometimes we actually will do something like a 361 degrees per time step. And this is really to help drive the flow through the system and eventually you know, you'll see more um, developed flow or expected flow profile. Once that is completed though, that's when we still go back and do you know, about three revolutions to clean up the flow profile with like three or five degrees with that kind of approach. So that might be another thing to reduce solve time for, for certain types of models. Okay. Uh, after solve time was CAD prep, and that, that could be a whole other discussion. And a lot of times it's, it's more of, you know, it depends on who you are. You know, if you are an analyst, you may not really have a whole lot of CAD experience, or you may not even have the CAD tools. You know, sometimes our users will just you know, use models from the designers and then try to use that. And that, that does end up being a little bit of a barrier because you need to go back and forth to prep your CAD. So that I would need to know a little more about you know, what about the CAD prep really is uh, a pitfall for you. Following that is accuracy, meshing, and then lastly, divergence. So I'm actually happy to see divergence is the smallest bucket. Um, so let me go see if there's any real questions that have come in around these topics. Paula, I, I think you've been looking at this. Yeah, I haven't seen any specifically. I'm just going to have one, one, actually. Yeah. Uh, just one of the questions is, says at the bottom, so talking about the accuracy of the traces that we're seeing. Um, this model is actually run with a pretty coarse mesh. Uh, just to get some nice results, and so I could pretty quickly capture the ramp up. Um, so I think you know that the traces aren't great, but with the additional mesh, we should actually see a pretty significant improvement. And you are going to see a strange response when you leave the rotating region, okay? Because in, inside the rotating region, the velocity contours are based on relative velocity. So you're you're removing the rotating component inside the rotating region. And then once it leaves, it is on a different streamline, in other words, because now it's not a relative velocity, it's an absolute velocity. And that's why you see that sudden bend when you leave the rotating region. There's a question here about... Um running uh, compressible models with rotating regions. Um, I think it's probably just worth mentioning that it's something that simulation CFD is capable of and you just generally stick to I guess both kind of setups in one so you use the rotating region um, guide that we've just kind of provided um, and also the compressible um, setup that you generally you know work with um, and that should be okay. But one of the kind of most important things, I guess, to bear in mind, and which is, I think, what Apollo said in the, the comments, is that you might need to make the time step slightly smaller to try and help capture those effects that are occurring. Do you think there's anything left to add, Royce, or I can't see anything that we haven't covered, actually? So 
So there's a couple of questions come in about um, running rotating regions within a closed environment. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a different setup to what we've just spoken about, so you wouldn't necessarily have the inlet and outlet. Um, it might be something maybe like a desk fan or a ceiling fan in a room. And that's entirely possible still to run and yeah, the, um, the, the person asking the question is correct. You don't necessarily need an outlet um, in those conditions, but you'd still apply the same principles that we've done here, the ramp up and the same kind of mesh quality. Uh, and then the result should be fine. Yeah, so Josh, neither Apollo or myself, in terms of when it comes to water age with pumps, it's not something we've ever really explored or really thought about much. So you know, if, if you want to talk about that more, uh, let's create a case so we can take that offline. We can talk about it and dig into it. So when it comes to a wind turbine, what boundary conditions should be considered for this? You know, tur there's turbine design and there's a pump design. So a turbine at this point, you know, you're going to have, you know, if it's a wind turbine, it's going to be a large domain with a you know, wind boundary condition, you know, miles per hour of some sort probably, on the inlet side of what would be pretty much a, of a wind tunnel approach. And then your three sidewalls, so your kind of top and uh, left and right perspective, you know, those would be probably a slip boundary condition or maybe the same velocity as what you have at the inlet. And then lastly, the outlet would be a zero pressure boundary condition. Then you're looking at what would your resulting RPM be for that actual turbine. So it's a little different because now it's flow driven instead of a prescribed motion as what John talked about here. Yeah, and we, we have had some users where they've actually, they have prescribed an RPM and then uh, based their, their decision, their design decision based on the, the torque produced. So, you know, for example, if you were to set, you know, a wind turbine to be spinning at, you know, 50 RPM for a given wind speed, at that point, if you get a um, positive torque, uh, at, what that means is that we are still, you know, um, <coughs> pumping more fluid, whereas if we, uh, you know, get a negative torque, so whether or not we're getting uh, you know the fluid acting on the the rotating region or the rotating region acting on the fluid uh, for kind of assessing what what the operating point could be as well and that sort of setup is much easier to perform it'll be much more stable so that's why Apollo brings it up and when you get to flow driven you generally need a smaller time step and you could run into some stability issues when trying to approach it initially uh, one thing to mention is when you get into rotating machinery, one application would be like mixing analyses, scalar mixing, and you know, we have lots of customers that do a great job or um, see great results in that kind of application as well. So that can be another thing. Um, you know, large tanks where you're trying to see how long it takes for that tank to get mixed together based on some sort of um, something being added to that tank, in other words. Otherwise, I'm not seeing any other questions, John, so you can you can end this as you see fit. Okay, yeah, I think I'll just add um, to what you were saying about the, the mixing tanks. We've seen lots of support cases, so a lot of customers seem to be running those with rotating regions. Um, and generally, you know, it's I guess we've kind of answered the problems they have in this um, hangout. Generally, they're down to um, terminus models, time step sizes, and mesh refinement, and pretty much they all work perfectly afterwards. 
Okay, so yeah, no other questions have come in. So um, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. And um, feel free to join us next week for the um, simulation mold flow hangout, um, where another colleague, Kristen, is going to be talking about um, how to try to match reality um, with mold flow as best as possible. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.